Hi, I'm Jerry Kenny, and thanks for joining us for this edition of America's Survival TV on Roku. Our guest tonight is the anti-communist Brazilian writer and philosopher Alavo de Carvalho. The new book, The USA and the New World Order, features a debate in which Alavo debates one of Russian President Vladimir Putin's key advisors, Alexander Dugin. Alavo is the president of the Inter-American Institute for Philosophy, Government, and Social Thought, and is one of the scheduled speakers at the March 21st Conclave for Democracy to be held at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. The goal of this event is to organize opposition leaders and political activists from Latin America on behalf of political and economic freedom in the Western Hemisphere. Alavo now lives in the United States, but has written extensively about how his home country of Brazil went Marxist. He said that it was through the destruction of high culture, the reduction of universities to centers of communist propaganda, and the country's descent to levels of moral degradation, which would have seemed unthinkable before. Well, doesn't that sound familiar? Well, can America be saved? Can the world be saved? Those are the topics tonight on America's Survival TV. And with that, we'll go to Cliff Kincaid in the Washington, D.C. area. Jerry, thanks a million. We do have a great treat tonight. We're going to be talking with Alavo de Carvalho, the Brazilian philosopher and writer who can explain not only what's happened to Brazil, uh, which is being led at the current time by Dilma Rousseff, the former uh, communist guerrilla, but can explain the same processes that were at work in Brazil as they affect the United States, not only America under Obama, but so many different countries throughout uh, Latin America. And he's somebody who has a long experience in living under not only Marxism, but debating the proponents of the anti-American left, including, most recently, Professor Alexander Dugin, who is an advisor to Russian President Vladimir Putin. Now, Jerry, in his introduction, mentioned this book. It's not actually out yet, but this is a pre-publication copy of Alavo debating Alexander Dugin, uh, on the subject of the New World Order and the USA. Now, the book is not out yet. This is a pre-publication copy, but we'll tell you how you can get information about this very, very interesting debate. We have to understand the competing forces in the world globally. And as a matter of fact, just today we have posted a new column I've written about uh, the role being played by the Roman Catholic Church in world affairs. Now, getting back to Alexander Dugan for a second, uh, faithful viewers of America's Survival TV know that we published last year this book, Back from the Dead, The Return of the Evil Empire. Now, if you look closely at that book, you look right under Putin on his left side there, that is the face of Alexander Dugan. And there is a section in that book on the influence of Dugan. This is uh, somebody who has combined various forces, various elements of totalitarian thought, uh, including certain occult elements from Russia, into this new vision, or we might call it a nightmare, for the world that Putin is pursuing. But of course, he's not doing this alone. Putin has a lot of elements and alliances behind him, not to mention one that's been in the news over the last week or so, the regime in Iran. But also, don't forget the international communist or Marxist left, which has been taking power country after country after country in Latin America. We're going to be talking about all of this and how we in the United States can hopefully uh, survive uh, such a fate here. Uh, but we're going to get into it uh, in order to understand what has happened to so much of the world. And we are on the road to some kind of, you could call it a world government, some kind of global community. That may be another euphemism. Who is going to dominate this unfolding, developing state of world affairs? We see these various competing 
units of power, Putin's Russia, the Roman Catholic Church, the international communist left, global Islam. What role will the United States play? Can we, in fact, survive the last two years of President Obama? These are all the questions on the agenda tonight as we welcome Alavo de Carvalho, again, president of the Inter-American Institute, a veteran anti-communist Brazilian writer and philosopher. Alavo, thanks for coming on the show with us tonight. Thank you for this kind invitation. It's a great pleasure to be with you again. Alavo, I've known you for many years. You've always been a fighter for uh, Western values, for Christian values. Uh, it must be so troubling to look at the success that our enemies have had around the world and, and to see the Roman Catholic Church. I know you're a Catholic. I'm a Catholic. We're very disturbed about uh, the path that uh, Pope Francis has been taking recently. And we can get into that. But explain, if you would, please, what has happened first to your country of Brazil, how you were one of the, uh, the a, a sort of a voice in the wilderness down there, uh, trying to be the resistance, speaking for the resistance to the Marxist wave, the revolutionaries who have taken power down there. How did it happen to a country like Brazil? No, uh, all these things have uh, started with uh, an organization called the São Paulo Forum. The, they gave this uh, neutral name on purpose. As, as Lula say, in order people didn't know what we are talking about inside. Huh? Uh, they started it in 1990. It was an idea from uh, Fidel Castro, Lula, and uh, Lula's friend, Frei Beto. Uh, they, they had a meeting in Havana. And they, they started this organization in 1990. And soon it had more than 100 organization members. Huh? Uh, this organization included legal political parties and criminal organizations, drug dealers, kidnappers, uh, like the uh, Chilean MIR, Movimiento de la Izquierda Revolucionaria, and the FARC, the uh, Colombian Revolutionary Armed Forces, who has the monopoly of the drug dealing in Latin America nowadays. Eh? A little, uh, with a little help from Mr. Clinton, who helped the Colombian government to fight the drug dealers with the condition of not touching the political organizations. So yeah. the cartels were destroyed and the FARC got everything in their hands. Eh? Uh, you know, in, in, in the United States, the tradition of the studies in uh, international affairs and political science is that the, the subject, the agent of everything are the states. And this is not correct about communist movement, because communist movement existed uh, 60 years before the Soviet Union and survived the so uh, Soviet Union. So communism has to be studied with a large world movement, not as the only the, uh, the arm of a government. And in the United States, for decades, even the best uh, students of the matter commit this mistake, the, the, uh, understanding communism only with an instrument of the Soviet Union. Mm -hmm. It is in part an uh, instrument of the Soviet Union, but it has an autonomy. You know, in, uh, in the year 2000, the French philosopher Jean-François Revel uh, wrote a book, La Grande Parade. I don't know how to translate this in English. How, how would you say it? La Grande Parade? The Great Parade. The Great Parade. Uh, uh, where he asked it, how it's possible that 10 years after the, the destruction of the, the Soviet Union, the communist movement is so strong when it should be uh, completely destroyed too. Well, th this is the answer. The uh, communist movement does not depend from the, the, the Soviet Union. It, has, it is an autonomous movement. It includes the Soviet Union, and not is included in it. Uh, uh, and it has many ways of action that escape the usual approach of the political scientists and international relations uh, students. Uh, some subtle ways of influencing the culture bit by bit. Mm -hmm. they, they learn, you know, in, in the, the 20s, the, the, the Hungarian philosopher Georg Lukas proposed some, some changes in the communist strategy. And he was repelled by the Soviet Union. They, they said, we don't want this here. But they sent him to Germany, where he founded the so-called Frankfurt School. 
And the speciality of the Frankfurt School is cultural penetration, cultural destruction. Uh, very subtle uh, and long-term destruction. And uh, destroying the, all, the, all the values, all the beliefs, all the, the, the trust, the confidence of people, one another, and uh, uh, spread suspicion everywhere, and uh, speak against everything. Yeah? And this was eroding the uh, national American culture and national American pride and, and so on. It was a very slow process. Uh, and most people could not evaluate the strength of the things. This is strength by a cumul cumulative effect eh? mm -hmm. along the decades. All this was not autonomous. The Soviet Union was uh, directed the whole process. Very subtle because the, the Comintern financed the, the Frankfurt School. Mm -hmm. When, when they, they created, these people from Frankfurt School created the idea of sex leave and gay rights and so on, the, uh, Stalin rejected all that. Say, I don't want this in the Soviet Union, but I want this in the Western world. Because this is destructive. We don't want destruction here, but we want destruction there. Uh, and they spread these people all around the world. Uh, it's a, a group of very strong intellectuals, not great philosophers, but uh, people who were uh, very able to, to, to perform the tasks, eh? like uh, Jürgen Habermas and Herbert Marcuse and Walter Benjamin. Uh, all of them influenced deeply American movies, especially American movies, since the 30s, with the, the school of uh, movie writers that was run by John Howard Lawson. Yeah. And he taught yeah. people, we will not make communist movies. We will make uh, normal movies that the American public can accept, but with small and discreet communist messages here and there. In every movie, every movie. Eh? So it's very difficult to find some American movie since the 30s and 40s uh, up to now that you don't, where you don't find any uh, anti-American message. Huh? Olavo, uh, let me let me uh, recap if I can. <clears throat> so we've what what we're witnessing here in Brazil, Venezuela, the United States, and many other countries throughout the hemisphere. Uh, and worldwide is the result of a Marxist or communist penetration of our society, our culture, uh, changing the very nature of our culture uh, in order to undermine us, to uh, rot us, uh, corrupt us from within. But in 1990, I understand you to be saying this is when the West, the United States, was saying, well, we'd won. We won the Cold War. The Soviet Union collapsed. and uh, But yet that's the very date, as you put it, when the Sao Paulo Forum, this collection, this coalition of anti-American communist uh, groups, even terrorist organizations, uh, began this intensive preparation for what is transpiring. You mentioned Lula, the predecessor, the president of Brazil, before uh, Rousseff, uh, working on this with Castro. Uh, they, they have been so successful to this point. Uh, when we look at Latin America, just Latin America, how many countries would you say we have in Latin America today that are not Marxist? Uh, only Chile, and, and Paraguay. <laughs> Chile and Paraguay. I mean, all that... the others are either governed by, by communist parties or under the strong influence of communists. And, and, and now, what, let me get your Colombia, thoughts. Colombia, also in Colombia, but in Colombia, the communists are very strong. Yeah. Not in electoral terms. They have very few votes, but they dominate the media and the judicial system. All the judges, they're bribed, all the judges. Eh? Now, I had always looked at Colombia as a success story. Uh, mm -hmm. Under the former president, Uribe, uh, somebody who, who fought the, the, the FARC, the uh, forces, uh, the communist terrorist uh, narcotics group, who fought them back with U.S. help. Uh, and yes, I, yes. And I know the uh, much maligned NSA played a role 
in helping Columbia at that time find out where the FARC leaders were and go in there and kill them. Uh, we know there was a great success there, yet it seems like when we look at Columbia today, Uribe is out of office. His former associate is now the president, Santos. He's negotiating with the FARC in Havana. Uh, what's going on with Colombia? You know, uh, Santos was elected under the slogan, no mas FARC, no more FARC. I was there. I saw the, the electoral campaign. I helped him in the campaign. <laughs> Uh, and uh, you, it was wonderful to see the enthusiasm of the Colombian people against the FARC. So everybody voted for Santos. He had more than 70% of the votes. It was a great success. And the next day, he betrayed everybody. Hmm. How, do you uh, well, how do you explain that? Was he uh, a secretly uh, an agent of the other side? Was he bribed? Has he been I, believe he was, I believe he was bribed because he was the minister of the F defense in the time of Uribe. And he did a great job against the FARC. But he changed his mind in 24 hours. I, mm. And so not only played it by, by bribery or, or any other secret manipulation, but I, I don't believe he was always a traitor, always an agent. No, no, it, this is impossible. Mm. Because he, it was he, the direct responsible for the military destruction of the FARC. Now, let me ask you about one other country which was in the news a couple years ago. Uh, when uh, Venezuela under Chavez was trying to take control, and that is Honduras. What's the situation there? I, I don't know how, what is happening now, but it, it looks it's not bad. It's, uh, it looks to be normal, stable. They have a stable democracy with a leftist president, but as a moderate guy, he will not persecute his, his uh, adversaries and, and so on. So it's, politically, it's normal. Huh? Mm-hmm. Mm -hmm. Now, the Sandinistas are back in power in Nicaragua. Uh, the leftists have taken uh, the presidency in El Salvador. I mean, all of, this, all of this has been happening while the United States and the West gloated in the collapse of communism. Was this, was this part of the deception to get us thinking that we had won? And meanwhile, they made all this progress from their perspective right under our noses in the Western Hemisphere? Yes, in part it was a deception, but in part it was also a, a mistake uh, from, from uh, American politicians and, and opinion makers. Because when uh, they defeated the Soviet Union, but not the communist movement. Yeah. They thought well, uh, those things were the same. They are not the same. This is the problem. Yeah. The, the communist movement created the Soviet Union and survived it. It's mm. very strong in the whole world. And nothing was done against it, against them. It was done against the, the, the Soviet Union and very well done by Ronald Reagan. Eh? But this is not everything. So as you just observed, the, in the very year that, where the, the Soviet Union was toppled, they were creating the Sao Paulo Forum. And the motto, the slogan was, we will reconquer in Latin America everything that we lost in East Europe. Mm -hmm. And they did it. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, nobody believed it because, you know, people in Brazil, they read the American press and believe everything. So when they read the Soviet Union is over, they said there is no more communism. There's no more, more problem. And I try to explain that, that the communist movement is not the same thing as the Soviet Union. But everybody say I was crazy. Yeah? Yeah. When I started writing about the Sao Paulo Forum, nobody believed it. Yeah, I, all, all, all this to, uh, I was not the first to, to, to investigate this. It was, uh, there was a lawyer in Sao Paulo called Jose Carlos Graça Wagner, a great friend of mine. He is already dead. But he had a, a full room full of uh, Sao Paulo foreign documents. And he wanted to, to, to write a book about it, but he had no time. He died. Uh, and he gave me part of these documents, and I started publishing. Uh, at that time, I had a column in the big uh, Brazilian newspaper, o Globo. And I, every week I wrote about the Sao Paulo Forum and everybody said, you're crazy, this is conspiracy theory, and, and so on. But in 2000, uh, I believe in 2003, no, 2005, Lula himself made two speeches in the celebration of the 15th anniversary of the Sao Paulo Forum, confessed everything. He told, 
Uh, the, we have this, this, this organization, it's not properly secret, but it's discreet so that nobody knows what we, we are talking inside it, and, and so on. And he, he told everything. And uh, soon after, there was a video of the third National Congress of the Workers' Party, Lula's Party, uh, confessing this Sao Paulo Forum is the strategical coordination of the left, left in Latin America. Because when I started writing about this, the uh, Workers' Party reacted, saying, oh, you are lying, the Sao Paulo Forum is just a club for debates, it has no authority at all, it, all this is a lie. I said, no, uh, the club of debates does not issue resolutions. <laughs> and every General Assembly of the, the Sao Paulo Forum ended with resolutions that were signed unanimously by 200 parties. So it was the whole of leftist politics in America that was decided in the, in the Sao Paulo Forum. And Lula even boasted that we put Hugo Chavez in the power. Because mm -hmm. Hugo Chavez only entered the Sao Paulo Forum when the organization was already uh, five years old. He was a newcomer. But he was very well received and people decided to promote him. And they put him in the, the presidency of, of Venezuela. And Lula boasted, boast, we did it. So there was a kind of mutual interference in the politics of several countries. Huh? The government of one country interfering in another one. This was, for them, was normal. And every, all this was secret. Mm -hmm. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Alavo de Carvalho. He's president of the Inter-American Institute. Uh, Go to his website at theinteramerican.org, theinteramerican.org. Now, uh, there's so much we, I'd like to talk to you about this uh, pre-publication copy of the book, The USA and the New World Order, with your debate uh, with uh, Putin advisor Alexander Dugan, is just fascinating in so many ways. I do want to talk about that as well as uh, President Obama and his a relationship with uh, this international communist movement. Of course, he regards Brazil as a friend, the government of Brazil. Uh, he just normalized relations with Castro's Cuba uh, using uh, Pope Francis as a mediator. Uh, let's get back to the old Soviet Union and Russia today and get your uh, thoughts on that, Alavo, because as I, as I read this debate you had with Dugan, uh, and we'll give you the website where you can read it for yourself up on the internet. And w when I read a very interesting article you have posted at your Inter-American Institute website as well, it seems like you've concluded that Dugan has combined, I think as you put it, elements of, of, of the old Soviet Union, Tsarist Russia, some esoteric philosophy, some elements of Nazi philosophy, I mean, it looks like he's throwing a heck of a lot of stuff together uh, to, to keep Russia going and to make Russia into a, a modern-day imperialist power. Is that a correct reading? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I believe that ideologically or philosophically, uh, Dugan's thought makes no sense at all. But it makes very good sense in the strategical point of view because he's, he's a great strategist. And his strategy is to gather everybody that ha has something to do or to speak against the United States. Mm -hmm. And gather everybody, communists, Nazis, uh, Muslim, fascists, traditionalists, everybody. And he is well, uh, well received in all these groups. And this is his magic. Eh? Mm -hmm. uh, we will not discuss our difference because we have uh, the... Uh, we have to first to, to destroy the great Satan, uh, that is the United States. He, he creates many strange theories that there are some at Atlantic powers and terrestrial powers, and the terrestrial powers are the good guys, and the Atlantic are the, the bad guys, and we have to destroy the Atlantic. Right, the Atlantic are the United States and, and Great Britain. Uh, 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 he, the, the most extraordinary, extraordinary things is that he is very well received in very different groups. Mm -hmm. Can you imagine communist, K, hardline KGBs sit on the, the same table with the, the French new right? Uh, yeah. 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 And traditionally, traditionalists, 
uh, disciples of René Guénon and Julius Evola. Uh, uh, and he, he is able to gather all these people and to make all them to, to speak like friends because they are all against the United States. This mm -hmm. is a work of genius, but it's not properly an ideology and it's not a philosophy. It is uh, a strategic conception. And let's talk a little bit about you know, the He inspired in part in, in Stalin because a few people know that Stalin uh, did a great job with the several nations in the Soviet Union. He stimulated nationalism in each of these nations, eh? and national culture and so on. Eh? The more nationalist they became, the more attached to the, to the Communist Party. And so he conciliated different uh, interests, completely antagonistic. Uh, uh, and Dugin is doing exactly the same thing. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, let's look at a couple elements of this Dugin approach that Putin seems to be following. Uh, what is... Is Israel a target? Uh, clearly, the Iranian nuclear weapons program wouldn't be where it is without Russian support. Russia has provided the nuclear reactors. Uh, Russia provides diplomatic support. Uh, what is Russia's role vis-a-vis -vis Israel? And, and what is the ultimate aim here? Is it to destroy Israel? And, and in your view, I know you're a supporter of Israel as I am. Do the Israelis, and they're coming up on an election in just about a week or so, do the Israelis realize the role being played by Russia in all of this? I am not sure if they are aware of this thing. But, you know, my, my main thesis in this debate was that uh, there are three big uh, globalist schemes in the world. Huh? There is the Western scheme, the, the, the Bilderberg, the, the George Soros and the Rockefellers and these people. And then there, are, there is the Russian-Chinese scheme that is uh, a hair of the old communists. And there is Islamic yeah. scheme. And they are competing. Sometimes they are competing. Sometimes they are collaborating. And the only countries uh, which have uh, condition to resist this are the United States and Israel because they have a strong uh, national uh, consciousness, the awareness, uh, they have traditions, they, they, and they have reason to fight. Yeah. All the others are, uh, are yielding uh, before this, this powers. You know, the, the, the European Union is itself an instrument of globalism. Eh? Uh, and we, you, you see no resistance except in the United States, in part of the United States, let's say half of the United States, the other half is globalist, uh, and in Israel. Uh, and so, so they, they have to destroy, absolutely to destroy the United States, in order to destroy the United States, they have to destroy Israel first. Mm -hmm. But it's not only Russia who wants this. Russia wants this, and the, the Muslims wants this, and the Western globalists want this too, mm -hmm. because mm -hmm. they cannot stand any kind of uh, national identity. Well, Israel has a st very strong national identity, and they have 5,000 years of reasons to, to, to have a national identity. They, they will not uh, accept this kind of uh, globalist uh, authority over them, never. And the, the Americans will not accept it either. Uh, and so these are the main obstacles, the United States and Israel. Mm -hmm. So we have, we have three great schemes. Well, and the Catholic Church. The Catholic Church could be and would ideally be the main center of resistance to these three schemes. But it looks to be adhering already to these things. Eh? Owing yes, to this hope, and this, that's the... Alavo, that's the subject of a column. Uh, I, I've written a couple articles about this. I've got one up today about uh, how a leading Marxist writer uh, has actually written a long piece. Let me uh, let me grab his name here. Has written a long piece. I quote it. I quote it in my own article as uh, referring to uh, the capture by, quote, progressive forces of the Vatican. And this 
Marxist says that, uh, in his view, Pope Francis, who comes from Argentina, who's a Jesuit, uh, is part of a process to take over the Vatican, to uh, uh, use it on behalf of these progressive forces internationally. And, uh, in other words, the left, the pro-communist, the anti-American left, is, is really hailing uh, what Francis is doing at the Vatican. So when we look at what the Roman Catholic Church under the control of Pope Francis is doing today, I noticed in your debate with Dugan, that was done back in 2011, uh, it wasn't so clear what road, what way, what path the Roman Catholic Church would take. Do you believe Francis today has been captured by the Marxists, or is he just confused and going back and forth and doesn't truly understand the global power struggle he's in? I believe he's confused. I believe he's not a very intelligent man. Mm -hmm. and, and, and he loves publicity. This is the problem. He's a vain man. Oh, it's obvious. He all makes, tries to, 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 uh, tries to pretend he's a very humble guy, but this is not true. He loves to be, to be seen and applauded. Huh? He craves this. Uh, and this is an uh, easy victim for these manipulators. But we have to take into consideration the fact that the, the infiltration of communists in the Catholic Church began in the 20s. Yes. We have now 90 years of infiltration. Mm -hmm. uh, so in the 60s, in the Second uh, Vatican Council, they were already very powerful. Uh, they control almost everything. And, you know, uh, the, the last pope, Benedict XVI, he used to say, my power stops at that door. Mm. He, f he felt surrounded. He felt as a prisoner. I don't believe he renounced it by uh, reasons of health. Yeah. I believe he, he uh, said, well, I cannot do nothing. I'm a prisoner. Uh, if I cannot do anything, I'll not stay here. Mm -hmm. uh, do you know Malachi Martin? Do you know Malachi Martin? Yes. He wrote a very good book in the time of John Paul II, called The Keys of This Blood. Yes. And he said that the mission of the, the uh, Catholic Church was to resist this globalist scheme. Mm -hmm. yeah? And uh, uh, John Paul II was very aware of what is happening. He understood the, the situation. He didn't know what to do, but he understood what happened. This man doesn't understand anything. Mm -hmm. he, I believe he's... Uh, a superficial mind. Huh? Well, that could be. Uh, maybe the jury is still out as to his motivation or uh, whether he does have a coherent, thought-out ideology or not. But uh, clearly when we talk about Barack Obama, at least in my view, we go back to 2008 when my group uh, released uh, documents on uh, the role of a Communist Party operative named Frank Marshall Davis in mentoring Barack Obama as a teenager out in Hawaii. We know Obama has this ideology. He's been, you might say, brainwashed into it. He clearly accepts it. Uh, we, we have a president of the United States six years into his term who's been, as we can see in so many areas, fundamentally transforming the United States. As somebody, Alavo, who's been here for several years and uh, who came out of Brazil, seeing the process underway there. What parallels are there between the United States and what happened in Brazil, and what can we do to resist or, or effectively counter it? Well, in 2008, I had this, the, the impression that, well, this guy is a Brazilian politician. In Brazil, we are used to this level of dishonesty and mendacity and so on, and Americans are not. Mm -hmm. eh? They, they cannot believe a guy can be so dishonest. Yeah? Uh, and I said, well, well they, they will need some time to get adapted to the situation, adapt their eyes to the situation and see what's going on. But if a guy can be elected president of the United States with false documents yeah, and with uh, uh, hiding uh, most of his biography and nobody can even ask him about it, well, and so the nation is defenseless against this kind of scheme. Yeah. Yes. And this is the problem here. The, the, this guy is, is a level of malice, uh, weakness, that the, the Americans are not using too. But they have to get used fast. <laughs> Otherwise, the same thing that happened in Brazil will happen here. 
and, and he refused. Now, now he people, people might might say, "Oh, come on, you know, Brazil's still a democracy. You've still got elections down there in Brazil. We have elections up here. We can elect a Republican Congress. We." Uh, Obama's going out of office in two years. We can elect a Republican president. Everything's going to turn around. Well, like, uh, turn around, but uh, during eight years, he can do a lot of things, a lot of destruction. Yeah. And then you have a new president. But, uh, this president will take 20 years to correct all the problems that Obama created. Uh, he, he did a great, uh, great harm to the United States. This is not... This is not free. Eh? This will cost lots of money and lots of time and lots of human effort. And all this could be avoided if in 2008, you know, uh, the first one who, who published some, uh, something about uh, Obama's documents was a lady called Debbie Schlussel. And everybody thought she was a little crazy. Eh? And I say, well, she's crazy, but she's telling the truth. The document is really false. <laughs> it's a, you can see with your own eyes. Eh? Uh, but nobody wanted to believe because this was too bad. This was uh, t uh, look at even too stupid. He said nobody will try to dupe us with such a, a childish uh, tr trick. Well, they did the childish trick and it worked. Eh? This is the fact. Yes. Now, whether his documents are real or not, I think my argument would be we knew enough about him even back in 2008 if the media had paid attention to our reports on his uh, uh, relationship with Frank Marshall Davis, his uh, ties to the Democratic Socialists, uh, the Communist terrorists in Chicago. I mean, I can go down the list. We knew all that. We knew about his connections to uh, pro-Arab terrorist groups, uh, pro-PLO groups, and still uh, we couldn't get the major media to pay attention, not even the conservative media for no, the most they, part. Nobody wanted to believe it. Yeah, nobody this wanted to believe it. to be true. This should be, maybe, is a right-wing conspiracy. The, yeah. The... <laughs> <laughs> yeah, well, so, I mean, this, is, this all sounds very, sounds almost pessimistic, though. Now, but, but in terms of... of of what we can do here, explain to our viewers as somebody who, who came out of Brazil, we up here in the United States, we see stories about, well, Brazil just went through another election and you had a very close election there on the presidential contest and Dilma Rousseff. It was, it was not an election because if the vo uh, counting of the votes is secret, you cannot trust it. This is not a real, it's, an, it's not a normal election. It's not a legitimate election. This is a fraud, a complete fraud. Mm -hmm. And the guy who was responsible for the counting of the votes as the president of the Electoral uh, Commission, he had been a lawyer for the attorney for the, the, the Workers' Party. He worked for the, the, the Workers' Party for years. Mm -hmm. And was a protege of the, 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 the Workers' Party. And he just uh, uh, returned the favors he received. So only 23 people follow the, the, the vote, uh, the uh, counting of the votes. This is so absurd. This is so obviously a fraud. Let me, let me give out some uh, identification information here. Ladies and gentlemen, we're talking with Alavo uh, de Carvalho, president of the Inter-American Institute. Uh, he's a prominent uh, Brazilian writer. Uh, and philosopher. Uh, his website is the interamerican.org. Uh, we've been referring to his debate uh, with uh, Alexander Dugan, uh, the Vladimir Putin advisor. Uh, this is a pre publication copy of the book, but you can uh, go to the website and read the debate for yourself. Uh, that uh, website is http colon slash slash debate alavo dugan dot blogspot dot com. That's debate Olavo Dugan dot blogspot dot com. Again, it's it's important. It's fascinating to to read this debate and un, and understand in concrete terms uh, what Dugan is up to and uh, how who are the global players in this unfolding drama, this global power struggle. Is there Alavo, any way in your view at this late date 
that we can avoid what looks like is coming a, a, a world socialist uh, regime or dictatorship of some kind? Of course, uh, we, we can always do something. We can always fight. But uh, the problem is that you have to get your eyes used to the new situation. Hmm? Uh, if people don't believe there are people that are so wicked, more wicked than they can imagine, mm -hmm. they will not fight them. This is the problem. It's a problem of vision. Get your vision, use it to, to uh, new, a new level of dishonesty, mm -hmm. a new, uh, an upgrade of dishonesty. Uh, uh, and this is happening before our very eyes. And in Brazil, in the beginning, nobody wanted to believe me because they, they had the same reaction. Oh, this is too bad to be true. Yeah. It, it took more than 15 years in order for people to uh, begin to pay attention to what I was saying. Now, you know, during these this meetings in the streets, uh, thousands of people uh, in the streets, they, they show uh, pancarts, how do you say, cartazes? Cartazes, how do you say this? The beginning inscription, Olavo is right. Ah. <laughs> everybody. <laughs> now everybody knows I was saying the truth, but it took more than 15 years. And here you have the same difficulty. You mm -hmm. have to insist and insist and insist and never give up. Never, 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 never. It's not a matter of ideology. It's not a matter that we are the right and they are the left. We are telling the truth. We are telling the facts. And they are lying. This is the main point. How much resistance is there in Brazil? Now, you know, today there was a news from the government itself. Do you know what the support for Dilma now? 7%. 7%. So 93% of the Brazilians are against Dilma Rousseff. And, 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 yet, and yet she just won that election, according to the official count. Didn't she, didn't she, she get about 52% of the vote? She won no election at all. Okay. How can you say that? Uh, how can we accept a uh -huh. secret counting of votes? Totally fraudulent. Totally fraudulent. Yeah. We can never accept this. An election has to be to have transparency. Huh? Everybody has to have access to the counting of the votes. And verified, and then we accept. Well, you won. We count the votes, and you won. That's okay. But we cannot count the votes. We cannot even see the votes. And the machines are programmed not to to, to be audited. They cannot be audited. Mm -hmm. So it's useless to count the votes now, because only the votes that are registered in the machines, only final results are there. These are these are the smartmatic machines. Smartmatic machines, yeah, that. And by the way, at, at, on that point, let me mention before I go to my co-host Jerry Kenny for some questions, uh, ladies and gentlemen, if you go to our website usasurvival.org, you'll see we have a, a story up there about this upcoming event called the Washington Conclave for Democracy. It's in Washington D.C. at the National Press Club on March 21st. It'll be from uh, 1 o'clock to 5 o'clock. Uh, that's a Saturday, March 21st, at the National Press Club in Washington, D.C. And this, uh, or this uh, coalition is designed to shed light on a lot of what we've been talking about today, what's been happening throughout Latin America. But in particular, uh, there's going to be a speaker who's going to focus on the use of these uh, so-called Smartmatic machines to manipulate or rig vote counts in places like Brazil and Venezuela. Uh, Alavo is going to be one of the speakers at this event. Uh, I'm going to be there myself. And so uh, we encourage you to, to, if you're in the Washington area, want to come. I, I've talked to the organizer, and we have his contact information there. He says it's open to the press and the public. And this will be a very important opportunity to, to hear from speakers from around Latin America about the stakes and how this ultimately will affect the United States. Uh, Jerry? Yes, Alavo, with uh, country after country uh, going uh, communist in Latin America, how much longer until Mexico becomes Marxist? Or uh, are they holding Mexico back because that might uh, just be a little too obvious to Americans? 
No, I, I'm not very well acquainted with this internal situation of Mexico. But uh, I believe that everything is so easy for these people now because there, there was no resistance. You know, in Brazil, resistance be, uh, began yesterday, less than one year ago. Mm -hmm. uh, and uh, during uh, many years, every, nobody wants to believe and nobody wanted to fight. This uh, Lenin used to say the best way to, 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 to win is to take from your enemy the will to fight. And nobody had will to fight. And suddenly it exploded everywhere. Huh? And now 93% of the Brazilians are against these people. Uh, I believe the same thing can happen everywhere. But the problem is most people, they don't want to see how serious the situation is. Because this, the, these people, they have been proceeding bit by bit, very, very slowly, very discreetly. Lula himself confesses it. There is a his speech was published in the very uh, official page of the Brazilian presidency in 2005, telling everything they were doing the the, the, the São Paulo Forum. And even so, people didn't want to believe. You know, in in 2000, uh, when was the first election? Which was the first election of Lula? 2002. Most military voted for Lula. Hmm. Because they believe, no, he's not a communist, he is a good guy, he is a, a, a Christian reformer and so on. The same type of thing they said about Mao Zedong in the 40s. Eh? Yeah, yeah. Uh, and now they, they know what's really happening. The, the human mind has this tendency not to believe bad news. They don't want to know. Only, only people who are, who are professionally involved in such studies can follow, can accept certain kind of facts that uh, the a normal, uh, com common citizen cannot accept. But bit by bit, they will accept, and they will know what's going on, and they will fight. What do you think about that, Jerry? Uh, you know, I, I think that, uh, you know, when we talk about Mexico in particular, as I was saying, maybe a part of the situation in Mexico is different because Mexico has a little bit of a safety valve, and that is that if people are unhappy in Mexico, regardless of what happens, they just migrate to the United States if they can. But, uh, I mean, the, the frightening thing is that we, it certainly appears as though we have a Marxist in our own White House. So I don't even know if uh, Mexico going Marxist would uh, be enough to frighten Americans into waking up. Yeah, Mexico does not need to to become Marxist because the United States are become are becoming Marxist. <laughs> uh, it's a it's a sad thing to say, uh, and and like you, Alavo, I was uh, very hopeful uh, that the Roman Catholic Church would lead the resistance to these various schemes. This is the church mission, huh? Yeah, yeah, yeah. It's 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 tragic to see what's happening. Uh, with the Pope uh, uh, making statements against capitalism, embracing all this so-called climate change rhetoric about how capitalism is destroying Mother Earth. Uh, 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 at this World Conference of Popular Movements at the Vatican last October that I write about in my column today, uh, the Pope uh, uh, met with uh, what Armando Valladares calls uh, Marxist revolutionaries. Uh, they were there in the Vatican with the Pope. Uh, the Pope met with them. Uh, he highlighted their, quote, struggle. He met with Evo Morales, the Marxist president of Bolivia, who, when he was reelected last uh, year, uh, gave credit to Fidel Castro and Hugo Chavez. But let me ask you this. Uh, when when we look at, at at the fact that that Marxism doesn't work economically, uh, and and we see what's happening in Brazil, but but even equally significant in Venezuela, where the economy is is just uh, deteriorating by the day, is is the corruption of the of the communists enough to wake a lot of people up? I believe this is another problem with the uh, American vision of these this things. Because uh, economic failure can topple a government in a democracy, yeah. but not in a dictatorship. A dictatorship gets stronger when it fails economically. 
<laughs> because if the people have not nothing to eat, they have no no money. They cannot organize themselves and react. Mm -hmm. They're they're weakened. It eh? so the, for a dictator, economic failure is good. <laughs> but in a democracy, of course, if you if uh, let's say if the the price of the uh, gas uh, goes very high, people get revolted. Eh? Mm -hmm. But if you have a dictator, a dic a dictatorial system. Uh, that uh, dominates the country, misery, poverty is good for them. So no matter how many economic failures they have, no matter how much corruption, it's not going to threaten their rule. Economic failure uh, can be uh, a political gain. Mm -hmm. But corruption is another thing. Hmm? Because when, when people hear about corruption, they feel they... they uh, we're robbed, eh? and they get revolted. Eh? Mm -hmm. But so poverty is one thing, economic failure is one thing, and, and corruption is another thing. It was cor is corruption that is destroying the worker party's system in Brazil, because but people are really angry with this. But as long as the workers' party runs the electoral process and can count the votes, they'll never give up power. They, they. they I believe they'll never give up. They have to be toppled mm -hmm. by a direct popular intervention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I don't believe very much in a military intervention, but I believe in popular intervention. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. They have to, to expel these people from political life forever. Now, what do we do, though, in the meantime about Vladimir Putin invading Ukraine, the United States under Obama refuses, refuses to even provide weapons to the Ukrainians to defend themselves. As long as Obama is in the president, you can do nothing. The United States are lost. Yeah? Mm -hmm. the, this guy, the other day he said that, that, that Venezuela is a threat to the United States. It's not. Venezuela is a threat to Brazil. What's a threat to the United States is Russia and China. Yeah. And the Muslim world, yeah. but he cannot say this. So, so see, he he blames Venezuela, a little country. Uh, this is is a, of course is disinformation. Venezuela has, is no problem for the United States, but Russia and China are, uh, because Russia and China are acting by means of Venezuela. Venezuela is an instrument for these people. Venezuela is not the the, the uh, uh, active agent of the situation. Huh? It's an instrument only. But Obama will never say this. Because he uh, is trying to collaborate with Russia and China and with Iran and so on. He's obviously against the United States. It's, yeah. uh, one, one needs to be blind not to see this. Huh? Yes. Well, it's an extraordinary situation uh, we have with a Marxist in the White House in the United States. Uh, the failure by so many uh, in our political system and our media including on the conservative side, to recognize uh, what's happening. I agree with you totally. There's still people who just can't bring themselves to admit uh, we have a Marxist in the White House and to react accordingly, to call him that, to uh, say it like it is. Uh, that's why I like you so much and your work. You're not only on target, but through your writings, this debate with Dugan, you offer a coherent philosophy of countering this dangerous alliance against uh, uh, the United States, against Israel, and our allies. You understand the basics of what it's going to take to save Western or Christian civilization. It's the same thing that Armando Valladares, who served 22 years in prison in Castro's Cuba, uh, said in his column that I quote today, uh, he talks about how he's so disappointed in the Pope who made this deal with Obama and Castro to recognize Cuba. He says this threatens the entire future uh, of Latin America. He puts it the Christian future of the Americas. And it's, is, isn't it true, I certainly get this from your writings, Alavo, and your debate with Dugan, that in order to save us, to save our country, to save our way of life, 
it's going to have to take a, a grounding in a religious approach that we course, have to tell us talk to talk to us about that that the necessity of of a Christian worldview or a Judeo Christian worldview. All civilizations in the world were based on religion. The story of lay civilization, this is stupidity. There is no lay civilization. Lay civilization is long is just an interface between Christian America and Muslim America or communist America. It's only an interface. So this uh, this illusion of uh, lay democracy, this is an illusion. Democracy only works if the people is Christian. This your founding fathers knew this. They said this many times. This is a constitution for a Christian people, period. Yes. I don't say that the state has to be Christian. No, there's no need for this. The state has not to 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 meddle to put his nose into this these matters. This is correct, as Jefferson used to say. But the people, the population, has to be Christian. They have to have values. They have to to have moral law, and so they can run. They can direct their own lives without the government interference. Yes, but if you start with this thing like sex lib and gay rights, etc., etc., well, all this is an illusion. You know, there is there is a book recent published by. Uh, wait, uh, I'll show you. I'll show you. <laughs> uh, uh, this guy, David Richards, is a gay ideologue in Great Britain. Mm -hmm. And he wrote this book, The Rise of Gay Rights and the Fall of the British Empire. Mm. And he said, we, the gays, we <laughs> topple the British Empire. Uh, and he's right. <laughs> because, you know, in every nation you have a kind of uh, an elite, an aristocracy or oligarchy. It, this is a fatality. This is everywhere. The problem is when the oligarchy uh, goes against the country in, instead of defending it. Yeah. How do you do this? You, you persuade them to get egoist, to think of their financial interests and sexual desires before and to postpone the interests of the nation. Huh? If a guy is very interested in sex pleasure, uh, he'll not be very generous. Huh? Sex pleasure is egoist by nature. Uh, and so the more a guy uh, uh, gets obsessed with sexual pleasure, uh, the more he decays. This is not a problem of being uh, heterosexual, homosexual. Right? In Brazil, there is a, a guy who is proposing heterosexual pride. This is stupidity. Yeah? <laughs> heterosexual, homosexual is sexual. <laughs> and any politics based in sexual desire is crazy and destructive. Anyone. And, you know, <clears throat> Stalin knew it. This is the reason Stalin did, uh, didn't accept these people for the Frankfurt School in the Soviet Union. He said... Yeah. You'll go to preach these doctors in Germany, in the United States, not here. <laughs> and, and it's gotten so Cultural bad, Marxism. gotten so bad that, as I wrote about in a recent column, we've got this person, this former army analyst, Bradley Manning, in Leavenworth, in prison in the United States. He's the one uh, serving 30, 35 years for espionage, for giving classified information to WikiLeaks. This guy, uh, he's a, obviously a troubled young man, is now in the process of going from Bradley Manning to Chelsea Manning, uh, becoming a transgendered. And we're at this point in the United States, you probably read this, Alavo, that the U.S. Army, our Army, is providing at taxpayer expense hormone treatments so he can become a woman. I mean, this is this is the kind of thing that's happened, uh, and, and I, I appreciate your point so much that in order to to reassert or to recapture our culture, we have to be morally upstanding, upright people, and and they are literally rotting us out from within. Yeah, they they are duping us. The, the, the Groucho Marx used it to say. Will you believe me or your own eyes? Hmm? <laughs> and these people are doing this with us because they, they dress a man as a woman and we have to accept she's a woman. <laughs> but I'm seeing she's not. 
I cannot believe my eyes. I have to, to, to believe the government. This is absurd. This is an attack to human intelligence, an attack to human consciousness. This is uh, an anthropologic, a crisis of anthropological dimensions. Huh? It is, I mean, the idea that two men can get married? No, no, no two men. Three men. In Thailand, the other day, there was a marriage of three men. <laughs> and what not four or five or 25 or 150, eh? A lot of men all naked, eh? doing group sex. This is now a family. Oh. <laughs> they want us to accept this. And seriously, we cannot laugh. Eh? If you laugh, you are homophobic. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> They're forbidding us to see with your, our own eyes. <laughs> yeah, you're right. I mean, we're, we're being taught to disregard what we see, what we know to be true, what we know to be based on morality and tradition. We're being taught, ignore all that and just accept it. Go along with it. Uh, as we slide, uh, I think it was the uh, famous judge who didn't make it to the Supreme Court uh, Robert Bork put it in his book, Sliding Towards Gomorrah. We're, we're sliding into the abyss, and, and yet so many of us are afraid to say, stop, we can't do this. We've got to save ourselves. We've got to save our country and our civilization, everything. We have to save our brain. <laughs> save our, everything is on the line. Jerry, what do you think? Well, I, I think that people really need to uh, understand what cultural Marxism is. You know, it's a... Uh, 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 there is a reason that they're trying to degrade, uh, you know, our culture uh, for political purposes. As you said, that's what it's all about. And there was a, uh, a quote, expert that was on the radio the other day, uh, a psychologist, psychiatrist, I don't know what she was, but she was uh, trying to explain to the audience here locally how uh, prostitution should be legalized. And I, at, at that time, I'd had just about enough and I called her and I said, you know, you experts are the ones that are, that are probably responsible for sending more people down the road to destruction. And I think that's what Americans have to look at. We have to look at our institutions, uh, uh, our universities, uh, these quote unquote experts that tell everybody if it feels good, do it. And, uh, and, and take a look at uh, the impact that it's having on our, on our nation. But when you destroy the culture, you destroy the nation. Of course. Well, and I, I think a lot of those so on target in so many ways that not only, only do we have to recognize the truth of what we see and, and recognize the depravity uh, and, and the slide towards Sodom and Gomorrah right in front of our eyes, but understand, as he, as he so eloquently puts it in his writings and on his website, that this is part of a long-term process. Of, uh, based on the communist movement that is, is now racing, uh, competing with these other global power centers for ultimate control of the world. Alavo, uh, you've given us a lot of time tonight, and I want to thank you for that. Our guest has been Alavo de Carvalho, president of the Inter-American Institute. Uh, we've given out your website, theinteramerican.org. I've mentioned uh, the upcoming conference in D.C., uh, Conclave for Democracy, March 21st at the National Press Club. Is there anything else, uh, Alavo, you'd like to add in conclusion? No, I'm very happy to, to, to talk with you again. It was a great honor for me. Uh, I, I, don't know, I, I love your work. I'm always reading your articles, and I love them. And uh, I know that America needs more guys like you. Well, we're, we thank you for that. We're trying our best, Jerry and I, to get this uh, Roku TV, uh, Internet streaming TV, uh, that we're doing now. We're also going to post this show on YouTube, but uh, we do it on Roku. Uh, and, and because of Jerry's efforts, we started this show almost two years ago. And we're in, at last count, over 70 countries around the world. We've gotten to some of our videos a great response from countries like Brazil uh, who, who say, hey, what's happening in America has happened to us. So we hope to bring people together through this new medium, if you will, uh, and exposing people to your writings. Uh, again, theinteramerican.org is your website. Uh, I hope to see you on the 21st in D.C., 
Alavo, thanks a million for spending this time with us. Thank you, Cliff. Thank you, Jerry Kenny. <laughs> God bless you. Thank you. Jerry? And that's our show for tonight. Uh, don't forget to log on to our website, which is usasurvival.org. Uh, those of you who are new to the program, uh, Cliff has some uh, real stem winders of, of articles. Uh, and we appreciate you tuning in. We'll be back again next Wednesday night at 9 o'clock Eastern here on America's Survival TV on Roku. Thanks for watching.